Um, I'm Sharon, and uh, I'm going to be the person presenting this webinar. And Laura Lee and Dominic are my co-hosts, and so they're going to be manning the chat and uh, questions and trying to, to, to do lots of things in the background. Um, so, uh, oops, sorry, yeah. Is it a valid source? Uh, what changes will it bring to your college classroom? So um, I've got a lot of slides and um, I'm probably gonna go through them fairly quickly. Uh, it's, don't stress, this is going to be available, recorded online and the PowerPoint is gonna be available online and all the sources um, are available at the end of the PowerPoint, but there's also, uh, there will be a link to the bibliography so that if you want to look, and I recommend going and signing up for the community of practice on LinkedIn. That's where a lot of the things were posted, and that's a really good place to continue the conversation and to ask more questions and, and watch for new developments, because this is something that's changing in real time. So the first slide is, who am I to be talking about AI? Um, I'm not a tech whiz, although Dominic said that I was, so maybe I am. <laughs> uh, basically, I, I've been teaching in SAGEP for, for about three decades, and before that I taught at primary school for a decade, and I've always used technology, always used computers and as ways to collaborate and communicate, and so I'm really interested in that space, that liminal space where technology and um, teaching overlap, technology and pedagogy overlap. I'm retired from stage of teaching, uh, which gives me a lot more time to read articles about AI. I think I've read about 50 in the last three months. Um, so all of this information is, is, is gathered from all of those things that I've been reading, put together with me thinking about teaching and pedagogy and um, what, what this means, uh, this change. Um, so yeah, I'm also, as part of my, my role with performing, curating a, a community of practice on LinkedIn. So there's a, a link, and I think somebody put that in the chat, supporting source savvy students. It's through a research project with Sloss and Lockle at um, universe at, uh, with performing University of Sherbrooke. And, and uh, so we're happy that you guys are here to be part of this and hope that you join the community of practice to, to help with that ongoing learning and talking about this issue. Because it's not that I know everything. This is just a place for us to come together and think about it. So you can use the chat for questions and comments and resources. And maybe just to start, I know that there are some people that are watching um, multiple people from the same link. And if in the chat, you could just say um, how many people you are, that would be great. If you wanna add how many people and where you're, where you're listening from that or watching from, that would be great. Just to help us get a sense of the numbers of people that are, that are here, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah, so. What is ChatGPT? It, it appeared a few months ago, uh, the last day of November. Um, it's free for now. It's easy to use. Uh, kids can use it. Maybe shouldn't, but could. Um, it requires a sign up. Sometimes some people, me, when I signed up, I needed to put my phone number in. And some people are uncomfortable with that, understandably. I think it depends on what you sign up with. I think if you sign up with the Gmail where, account where you already have a, a telephone number affiliated with it, you don't need to put your phone number in. I'm not exactly sure why, um, but whatever. So you have to sign up. It's a tool that understands and responds in conversation form. And it can be used as a source of information and a writing tool. Those are sort of the two big um, uses. Um, why is it such a big deal for teaching? It's a game changer. Lots of tasks that we ask students to do, um, chat GPT can do them. And it's hard to detect. It's not something that you're going to be able to feed through, turn it in, and it's going to tell you, um, you know, that this part was, was taken because it's regenerated each time. And I'll talk more about that later. It can be wrong. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, and it also has a problem with providing sources. At first, we thought it couldn't provide sources at all. It can. It's just that it can also completely fabricate them. So it's not reliable that way. So can we just block it? Some Somebody told me Harvard University has blocked it. Um, and I think the New York City School Board has blocked it. So some organizations uh, are going that way. Um, it's probably not effective. Students still have phones in, in their pocket and can still access it. They can use it at home. It's a new reality. Teachers and students both need to learn how to live with it. And it's not the only one. There are lots of AI tools out there. It's just for right now, it's the most 
impressive um, revolutionary one, but there are other ones falling very fast that are that are within within days or weeks or months will be coming out. Um, and and there's lots of other tools besides large language models. There's also, also things that can um, make images and they, uh, tools that can make videos. So so IA is sorry AI is something that we're going to just keep seeing more of. So the consensus to date is that it's difficult to police. Um, and is this role where we really want to spend our time? Uh, there's an app for that, but it's not very accurate so far. Um, you can get false positives, you can get false negatives. Uh, it's a bit of an arms race on both sides. Uh, and it, I think for me, this is the biggest thing, it undermines trust. Um, so if you're trying to police whether they've used or students have used chat GPT or not, it's putting you in, in an awkward position and putting your students in an awkward position. So there are serious ethical issues surrounding the use of chat GPT. The biggest one for me is, is that the, the people who made it, uh, open AI outsourced work uh, to people in Kenya that um, where they had to go through the data and it was traumatizing data. So sexual assaults or uh, things that, and they had to go through to take it out. Um, and, and so, and they were paid like $2 an hour or something and, and, and were, had, had consequences, psychological consequences from that and sociological consequences. So, you know, when you're using a tool like this and you know, it's a bit like blood diamonds, are you, you know, do you really want to go there? So for lots of people, that's just, it finishes there. And I understand that. Um, it also has a large environmental footprint, like anything that's running lots of um, computers, uh, it's, it's, it's putting out carbon. Um, but even if you don't choose to use it, you still need to understand it and be aware of how it can be used by students so that you can think about your teaching in consequence of its existence. So even if we are against using it, we still need to understand it. So that's the next thing I'm going to talk to you about. Um, is there an upside about it? It's a potential tool for teaching and learning. Um, teachers and pedagogical experts are, are talking about more ways to do this. And that the end of the, the workshop is that. So where do you start? I think the start, you need to try to read about it and or try it yourself and, and see what it can do. And I'm going to show you some examples. Um, and I highly recommend, even though I have reservations ethically about using this tool, that you go try it because the best way to understand how it works is, is to try it yourself. Um, we need to understand its capabilities and its limitations. And after you have an idea of what it is and what it can do, you integrate artificial intelligence into your teaching as much as you're comfortable with. A minimum would be at least you need to talk about artificial intelligence with your students. You need to, you need to understand with them because we're all learning it's a it's a giant community of practice trying to understand artificial intelligence um what is it is it ethical to use it you know all, all sorts of things so and, and there are lots of other people um, who are going to use it uh, i'm going to use it with my mtp students this term um so you know you make your decision and then you then you need to um figure out how you're going to put that into practice in your class. So we're going to do a little poll. Have you tried ChatGPT? And the answers are a little, uh, no, a little, an hour is a fun. And then the second question is, as of this moment, on a scale of yes, maybe no, what are the chances that you might consider using ChatGPT in your course? And then we're going to put that second question again at the end to see if you've changed. I'm just going to let that sit there for a while uh, so we can watch. Sharon, are the presenters the only people who can watch the answers? Because we're not seeing anything. Uh, you're not seeing it. So I'm guessing, can somebody send, I, th we, I think when we end it, we can send out the the um, answer, the, like the, the picture. Of what, what That's right. Answer. We're just leave, letting people answer. 
and then okay. we'll be able to share. It must be getting close. It slowed down. So yeah, that's really interesting. So are you gonna end it and share? So um, you can see that about a third no and uh, about two thirds yes. Um, less people <laughs> and the hours of fun end, but uh, that's that's an interesting picture. And um, so yes and maybe I, I should have put an I should have put a no. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know. Why I didn't put a no for for the for that one. Or it was there, but I think um, it didn't get put on. Uh, or maybe it's down at the bottom. Sorry. Yeah, I need to just use that. Okay, sorry, it's there. <laughs> so, okay, so less people know and lots of yes and maybe. So that'll be interesting to see at the end. So I'm going to stop sharing that, I think. Um, oh, did you share the results already? I can't remember. Yeah, okay, we're good. Okay, so I'll keep going with this. So each time you see one of these big eggs with chat GPT, we're, we're switching um, sections. And I think there's about four sections. So what can chat GPT do? So here's an example, a fun example. Um, I listened to CBC radio uh, just before Christmas and they were talking about, it was with three chefs from different countries and they were talking about cool things that they do in other countries at New Year's. And I was like, that's interesting. So I asked chat GPT, uh, what are some other examples? Give me 10 examples of cool things people do at New Year's in other countries. And so you can see, you know, uh, one of my favorites is in Chile, people drag a suitcase around the block at midnight to ensure they'll travel and then come in here. Um, some people wear polka dots, some people eat grapes, uh, some people smash pomegranates. So I could ask this question on Google and I would probably get an article that would explain it to me, but it wouldn't be collated like this. Like what ChatGPT is doing is looking at a hundred articles or a thousand articles, I don't even know, and, and showing me sort of 10 examples. And I could ask it, give me 10 more, and it would give me 10 more. So it, it's just fun. <laughs> and it's also interesting as a teacher to think about how could I use this with my students? And, and as a student to think about, hmm, how could I use this to get ideas when I'm trying to do projects for school? And then we need to help our students think and ourselves think about how does this work? Is this ethical? Is this their work? It, you know, when we go and do research on, on Wikipedia or on Google, we're getting information like this, but we have to read a lot longer to get this kind of uh, pared down information. So, you know, is that, are, are we, are we wanting students to have to do all that big reading part or is it okay that they just get this served to them on a platter like this? And even if it's not okay, this is going to happen. So then we need to think about what do we do as teachers? Uh, here's another fun example. So ChatGPT can write poems. So this is one of my early ones. Um, and, uh, I said, can you write a poem about the difficulties of an Anglophone living in regional Quebec? Because I wanted to see, could it do something fairly specific? And it's not, it's not great poetry. I don't think this is going to, you know, last like Shakespeare, but it's not bad. And one of the things I noticed when you put in um, requests like this, this that the, the program is made to be upbeat. Okay, so it's not going to come with a negative answer unless maybe you ask for a sad ending. And then I have a feeling it would even give you a sad ending with an up twist. Um, you know, try it and see. Um, so that's the second example. And then I asked it uh, the question, which is the basic question of this of this webinar. You know, is it a reliable source for, is ChatGPT a reliable source for students in Quebec to use for their homework? And here's what it says. Basically, not really. It can be used as a reference, but not as a primary source. So then I said, okay, so if they use it, how do they cite it? And it gave me this possibility. My guess is that APA is going to come out really soon with specific ways that we cite artificial intelligence. But for now, this isn't bad. It's saying where they got it and when. And I think what I would add, ask my students to add is something like what they used it for. Most, most people are asking for that. Um, and then I started a new conversation. So the way ChatGPT works is that it is with conversations. So if you're in the same conversation, it remembers what you said before and it keeps 
adding on to that. But when you start a new conversation, it's like a clean slate. So I said, okay, chat GPT, how do you compare with Wikipedia and Google? And so it gave me a little paragraph saying that they're both search engines and information retrieval systems, whereas I'm more of, um, a, a, I generate human-like text based on a prompt. So I'm less efficient than searching a database in Wikipedia or Google. So I thought, okay, can you, can you tell me a little bit more, explain further, give me examples? So it says, okay, Wikipedia, it's an online encyclopedia with a vast amount of information on a wide variety of topics. It's organized and indexed, easily searched and retrieved. And it gave me an example. Then I said, okay. And then it talked about Google search engine. As, um, it's similar to Wikipedia. It's also a tool for searching and retrieving information from the internet. So as opposed to Wikipedia, which is sort of a closed set of information, Google searches everywhere and all sorts of sources. Um, so it's more powerful than Wikipedia. It can get you something on virtually any topic from a wide variety of sources, including websites and images and videos. So, and it gives an example. And then it says ChatGPT on the other hand, it's a language generation model. It can generate human-like text based on a given prompt, but it's not designed to search and retrieve specific pieces of information. It, I like this word, may include the information you're looking for, may but you might not be able to find it and it's going to be less efficient. And then it gives you a nice summary. So you can see how ChatGPT is, is kind of predisposed to, to respond in an essay-like format. It didn't give us an introduction, but it did give us a paragraph about each of the three tools and then a little summary. Then I thought, okay, can you put this into a chart? And it said, I can't do a chart, but I can do a table. And I was like, I meant a table. <laughs> um, and I didn't give it topic headings or anything. It just made this. So it said, okay, here's the tool. Here's the description. Here's the use case. And it's pretty good. Wikipedia is an online encyclopedia with vast amounts of information on a wide variety of topics. Google is a search engine, um, can search for a range, a wide range of sources. And ChatGPT is a language generation model that generates human-like text based on a given prompt. And then it says, you know, but not as efficient as specific searching information. So here's where it gets really fun. Then I said, um, all right, can you, can you make a funny metaphor illustrating the same information? And it said, sure. Do, do you notice I'm falling into the, the, the danger where you start talking to it like a human to see me responding? Great, like it needs feedback. <laughs> And then it responds to me, sure. Um, here's a funny metaphor that illustrates the same information. Wikipedia is like a trusty old librarian who knows where every book is on the shelf and can find the information, you quickly find the information you're looking for. Google search engine is like a super librarian with a magic wand that can find information from all over the world in the blink of an eye. Chat GTP is like a witty storyteller who can spin a tale about any topic but might not always know where the specific information you're looking for is hidden in the story. I don't know. Is anybody else impressed by that? I was like super impressed by this. Uh, this was early on and I hadn't experimented very much. And I was like, that's actually pretty good. That really helps me understand because I'd been really thinking about that. Okay, so what's the difference? How is it different to go look for something on chat GPT than to go look for something on Wikipedia or Google. Where, where am I getting some sort of ethical pushback from using this tool? And I'm, I don't have an answer, but anyway, um, it did this. And so I thought I need to do a drawing of these librarians and uh, the witty storyteller. So here are three drawings of the trusty librarian who is Wikipedia, the super librarian, who can get something from you anywhere around the world has magic wand um, and the witty storyteller. So how could I use this as a teacher? This is kind of an interesting idea. You could get it to give you a metaphor or um, some other form, you know, ask for a haiku of Hamlet and then get your students to, to illustrate it or to discuss whether it's accurate. Um, and, and talk about what's missing. This is the kind of thing that makes people really excited about ChatGPT um, in spite of all the, the drawbacks. So right, new section, 
What is the problem with a witty storyteller? What makes AI an unreliable source? Because remember this community practice is called supporting source savvy students. And this webinar is called, is AI a valid source? And so we're really focusing on this. You know, can you go use information from ChatGPT and, and be confident about what you're getting? So the basic answer is no. <laughs> um, so I learned a new word a, a couple of weeks ago, hallucinate. So that's the term they use for AI. AI hallucinates, um, it generates plausible facts. And the keyword is plausible. Because of the way it works, it's a prediction, predictive uh, tool. So you know when you're writing an email and you're typing something in and it's saying, maybe you want this word next, or even in Google when you're searching for something and you add, you know, you put one word and it's finishing it. Um, so that's AI that's working. It's predicting based on all the other people that wrote this and all the things that I've read, all the data that I looked at, this is probably one of the words you're looking for. It might not be, but you know, so that's how it's working. It's not a calculator. There's no two plus three equals five. It's more like, hmm, this is what lots of people had. So the probability that this might be what you're looking for, I'm going to give you this. So you, there, there's not any kind of logical structure to the answers that you're getting. It's, it's guessing. And Bender and colleagues came up with the term stochastic parrot um, for large language models with huge database that's drawn solely from the internet. A lot of the information that went into ChatGPT supposedly came from Reddit. Um, and the internet is flowing with weird ideas. This is a quote from one of the articles um, about how learning works. So this is a, a, a university professor who was getting his, his education students to um, analyze what the project that they had done. And it, ChatGPT wasn't good at it because the data in the system was basically wrong. It was largely hogwash are his words. So consequently, ChatGPT just probabilistic parrots back the nonsense when he prompted, prompted it with the critical review task. So that's one of the things that it's not good at. Um, something that that is that there's infer lots of information floating around out there that's incorrect. So here's my little drawing of stochastic parrots. Um, just to help you remember that. So it's it's not it's not telling you real things. It's using probability to just put sentences together that sound good, that it thinks you want. Here's an example. So my daughter just spent the last three months in um, the Caribbean. She just got back uh, to Quebec, and she was working with researchers. And one morning she called me and she said, "Mom, is it?" is it okay to use ChatGPT for research? And I was like, ooh, you asked the right person. I've been reading about this for three months. Um, so I talked to them for like a half an hour and I said, yes, but you can't count in on anything that it's telling you. you. You need to check everything. So it's okay to sort of look for information, to generate maybe a, 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 an organization for what you're trying to say, to, to hypothesize or to brainstorm but you have to check any kind of facts. So she asked it, she was looking for information on um, sea pearl seaweed. So you can see a picture of it there from, from Wikipedia. And so the bottom one that's, you, know, you can't see all of it. She said, tell me about sea pearl seaweed. And it spit back, sea pearl seaweed is a special blah, blah, blah. And it gave a Latin name that's for the other plant that you can see over on the, on the right-hand side. And she's a, she just graduated from Laval in agronomy. So she knows that that's not right. But if you didn't know, you would take that for cash and just say, okay, here's the Latin name for this sea pearl seaweed. And then the description of the plant came from another plant. Um, so if you didn't know, there would be no way for you to judge this information. So that's awkward at the very least for our students, right? Um, and then, so she thought, okay, I'll ask a new question. She said, which is also related to her sea pearl seaweed. She said, because if you look at the part that's um, highlighted in yellow at the bottom left-hand corner of the page, it says that 
it's among cpral seaweed is among the largest known single celled organisms so she said what's the biggest single celled organism <laughs> it says the largest known single celled organism is an ostrich egg which is just like what <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't make any sense at all so hallucination remember that that's the term that's used for um surprisingly convincing pseudo facts that ai invents bob has a question oh you need to hit your mic open your mic I just want to respond and say, but like any resource used in research, it needs to be cross-checked. Yes, you're right. And right. examined. Yeah, so you're right. That and and absolutely anything we look up on on Google, we need to also check and see if it's valid. Wikipedia, I'm a little more sure of, but even then, you need to cross-check it and be sure. Um, so absolutely. So this is a a flow chart that I found on um, the. French sector of the Cégeps has this beautiful, now I'm forgetting, maybe, maybe Laura Lee, I don't know if you want to share that, that name in the, in the chat. Thanks. Um, it, it's got 3,600 members already. So lots of people are really interested in this. Um, and this is a flowchart I found on that um, Facebook group that, that is looking at chat GPT. So is it safe to use chat GPT for your task? And the, you start and it says, does it matter if the output is true? And that might sound like a ridiculous question, but there are times when it does not matter. If I'm making up a story or I want it to write six business letter examples so that my students can find what's wrong with them, um, then it doesn't matter. So it's okay to use it. It's safe to use ChatGPT for those things. If it does matter that the output is true, then the next question is, do you have the expertise to verify that the output is accurate? If no, then it's unsafe. If yes, are you willing to take full responsibility, legal, moral, et cetera, for missed inaccuracies? If it's yes, then it's not even, it's safe to use. It's like, it's possible to use ChatGPT and then with the asterisks, but be sure to verify each output word and sentence for accuracy and common sense. So even though I actually personally kind of like the idea of using ChatGPT for, for education, you need to keep this flow chart in mind when you are. So this is my last drawing of the of, of, of my original artwork. So I was thinking to myself that if I had to put a dog breed on chat GBT, it would be a golden retriever because I've already heard somebody say a trainer or I don't know somebody who knew something about dogs and we had a golden retriever at one point that they're easy to train because they want to do what you want them to do as opposed to say <laughs> I'm trying to think of another breed of dog but there are lots of breeds of dog that really only want to do what they want to do. Um, uh, and they might help you, or maybe a cat is better for an example of that. But yeah, so I'm a large language model. I've been trained on massive data sets. My eagerness to answer is stronger than my ability to be right. And I, I think because that's how it's built to respond, and maybe, maybe they'll improve this. I don't know how, because again, it's a stochastic parrot. It's just giving back what it has. I guess the data sets that you have, if you can have better data sets, then it's going to give you better information. Um, but yeah, so just, just that's, what's the problem with the witty storyteller. There's also problems of bias, like anything that we're reading, even in book, you know, print sources, but I think the internet magnifies bias. Um, so what are some of the problems with bias in the program? Um, it's trained on data set th that there's biases present in the data. So then it's perpetuating those stereotypes of gender bias, racial bias, socioeconomic bias, geographical bias, historical bias. And I like this, the biases are not, this is from ChatGPT, this is an answer that it spit out, are not always intentional. And I was thinking, are there times when you're intentionally biased? I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's an unintended content, consequence of the, the data the model was trained on. So you need to be aware of that. But that's true, again, like Bob said, that's true for any set of sources that you're going to look at. Ethical in, in implications. I find this trickier than it first looks. We already accept feedback and advice from AI tools when we're writing our emails, right? I don't know, does anybody else use that tab when it's got the right word? So you're using AI for that. So then where's the line? Is it okay to use it for an online? You know, can you use it for brainstorming ideas? Can you use it to give you ideas for an introduction or a conclusion? There's also questions about copyright of the material that was used to train the bot. 
um, you know, somebody wrote those things and they're not getting any credit for it. Again, I don't have the answer to that, but it's something to talk about with your students and to think about for yourself and your students, um, considering the environmental impacts and the harm to workers. So, so there's lots of ethical implications to, to the utilization of a tool like this. New section. Now that you know what it is and what it can do and what the problems are with it, what can teachers do? Will, Willie, you have a question. I'm just, I'm very curious with, with the use of the word to train the AI and yeah. not to program the AI. I'm just kind of intrigued by that. Any comments? Yeah. So I don't know enough about computers to help you, but it's not programmed. It's really, it really is trained. That's the, that's the language that's that you the use. Word. Okay. Okay. It's Fascinating. Not, it's not, it's not a program that you've entered in code that it's like, looking at what you said and then responding using code. It's really predictive. So it's looking at how all of, all of these sources that it looked at, they call it scraping the data, I think. All of these sources that it's looked at, this connects with this and this word is usually after this. And so when it's giving you something, it's learned, they, and they do use the word learn, it's learned what probably comes next and that's what it's giving you that's why so, sorry by association yeah yeah okay, okay. And, makes sense and that's okay, why it's, it sounds so good that's why the, the 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 hallucinations it gives us are are so plausible because it's it's almost right you know it sounds good um i saw that i think it was github which is a coding group or website, I don't, I don't really, I don't go there, I don't know anything about it, but they had banned the use of answers for code problems from ChatGPT. And the reason they gave was that it was so, it was, they were wrong, but they looked so right that it was hard to figure out where the problem was. And I think that's kind of the problem in the language too. It looks so right that, we're, we're a bit at a loss. I, I put in prompts for my journal entries for the MTP equity, diversity and inclusion course. And it gave me answers that I would have given full marks to, you know, at master's level. So it's, it's, it's very good. Um, maybe there was some depth that, that wasn't there, but sometimes answers from students don't have that either. Sometimes they do, but you know what I mean? And specificity, but you can say, you know, I want you to think about diversity, equity and inclusion issues in Montreal and take into consideration um, indigenous um, issues like decolonization and uh, the, the effects intergenerational trauma of residential schools. and it will give you that. <laughs> so you can, with one of the skills that I think as teachers, we need to help our students is writing good prompts. Um, that's gonna be a new a new part of what is goes into our, our Devi Ministeriel, or I don't know exactly where it goes. I guess it's just part of writing, but that's going to be a skill that's now needed, that everybody needs. So what can teachers do? Steps to take to make your course uh, more AI ready. So you need to think about your course objectives and how they align with things like fact retrieval versus critical thinking, analysis, reflection on individual human experience, that kind of thing. Um, if there's a lot of fact retrieval, you maybe need to, to shift things. Um, you might wanna rethink some of your assessments it's connected to that first box. Um, you might wanna think about your ponderation. Ponderation is something we talk a lot about in Performa. And I, I'm not sure that everybody thinks about that uh, deeply. Uh, we think about our ponderation as our hours of class and our homework time, but we don't really worry if we go over in the homework time. That's sort of, we put that on the students. But if you, one of the things I try to get my performance students to think about is this, if everybody's doing that, if I'm giving you seven hours of homework instead of three hours of homework, where are those hours coming from? They're coming from 
one of the other classes that way they're not doing those home that homework so if your ponderation is is too large if you're taking too many hours of your students time you're maybe pushing them into situations where cheating feels like the only option and they're turning to ai so think about that that's that 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 would be a place to test another place to, to to go um make time for discussions about ethics learning growth mindset you know that idea that what you're doing in my class isn't just about getting the marks but getting the skills so if you're getting ai to do it for you you're not getting the skills so so you know get your students to to be a more self-aware of, of what they're doing and why they're doing it and then the next step is to include a policy statement about ai on your course outline if your course outline has already gone out like for this course probably put it on your course website or in, in Omnivox. You need to be clear to students about what you're thinking. If it's okay that they use it, they can kind of use it if you don't want them using it at all. And so here are three examples on social media that were generated by ChatGPT. And I'm not gonna read these. That This will be available in the, the community of practice on LinkedIn and uh, I think on the performer website as well. So. Basically, there are three examples of policy statements for, for a post-secondary level. And one says, yes, you can use it. One says no. And one says maybe and gives guardrails for that. Um, this is my policy for AI use in the course that I'm teaching right now with Performa, the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. If you're interested in the course, it's going to run again in the summer. Um, and there's a link to the full policy. I found I couldn't write just a paragraph. This is like a page and a half long because I needed to explain what it was, why I wanted them to have the possibility of using it, how I wanted them to use it, what wasn't acceptable. And then I gave them an ethical disclaimer and a way to cite it as a source. And that just took more than a paragraph. So um, I think somebody's putting the link to that in the, the chat. I just put it on, available on the web so you can go look at that. You need to decide for yourself what's okay and, um, and, and then make that clear with your students. And, and I don't know if you noticed, I, I should show you that. I didn't want to force anybody to use it because of the ethical issues and because some people don't like to sign up for things like that. So what I plan to do is give some examples. So for the journals, I'm gonna say, you can use it. And here are some examples, I'll put them in a folder. Some people don't like to see them. They feel like it interferes with their creativity. So they don't have to go look at them, but if they wanna go look at them, they can use that as a starting place or you know, use it as a way not to respond however they want to. Um, I think for my performance students, it's a nice sandbox to play with the tool so that they become more aware of what it can do so that they're able to think about the courses at SAGEP and their students and how they're how they're using it and how they can revise maybe their their assessments and um, the things that they're asking students to do with that in in consequence either to use it or to not make it possible to use it or to try and cut down the possibilities of using it because it's really hard to to completely weed it out so let's move to um something more positive so i asked chat gbt can you give me 10 best practices for using um chat gbt with quebec college students um for example activities or assessments and i'm not going to read those they're they're available but there are lots of interesting things and then you could ask for 10 more and then you could ask for 10 more um there's going to be some overlap but um there are lots of ways there are also lots of people on the internet who are putting out information about how you can use this. So this website, Ditch That Textbook, um, has, has given 20 pretty interesting. So it's more curated, I would say, than what ChatGPT is, is, is um, generating um, ideas for how to use this. And some of these are really, really interesting. And this is available, you can find it online, but it's also in the PowerPoint. And there's a French version in that I saw somebody post in that um, uh, French uh, uh, Facebook group on ChatGPT. 
There's lots of stuff circulating on the web. Here's another example. So most of us know what think, pair, share, how it works, but they're saying, what a cool idea to add chat GPT in the middle of think, pair, share. So you get them to think individually. They pair up and talk about what they already have. Then they both go to their computer and ask the question, uh, put in prompts for chat GPT about the issue. Then they pair again, say what we've got, and then they share with the whole group. So it just expands. Remember I said, at the beginning, what's the difference between searching on Google and searching on ChatGPT? Well, Google, you're reading one article at a time. With ChatGPT, it's looking at thousands of articles and giving you sort of a filtered information. So uh, these ideas came from me reading through or rereading through all the articles and making lists. So these are things that I'm seeing repeated over and over again in people who are talking about pedagogy. So um, improving transfer. So multiple examples. So I'm a nursing teacher and I want to have uh, 20 case studies for my class so that they can look at a bunch of different examples of heart attacks. I don't know. Um, and if I have to generate all those, it's going to take me hours, but I can just give that prompt to chat GPT and it's going to, it's going to spit them out in seconds. Um, recall. So get students to go look up something on chat GPT and then, or on AI, and um, then without reading it, get them to do that recall, which is one of the great ways to, to anchor learning. Um, teaching how to evaluate. So, AI acts as a student. Um, Maggie McDonald put something up on, on um, the Quebec Teachers Lounge, which is a community of practice that grew out of um, the pandemic uh, for stage of teachers on Facebook. And she said that she had, um, I think that's where she put it. Anyway, uh, she had got it to generate, uh, I forget if it was a short story or whatever, and then have the students critique it. Um, because they were let more willing to critique something that wasn't didn't belong to a human person. They were felt more comfortable saying this is bad or this is wrong or this could be better um, when it was generated by the AI rather than somebody they knew in their class. Rhetorical analysis, um, peer review of AI texts. Um, so you could you could um, it, it's similar to that to the. Uh, the middle yellow one, but it, uh, you can get a bunch of text generated and then get students to evaluate them according to criteria that they've set. You can revise AI text is similar to that. Um, this, I like this one, spot the AI. So have a student version and a, a human version and see if they can tell which one was written by AI. That'd be really good for discussions of ethics. Um, teach them how to refine prompts, get them to practice refining prompts. And that, you wouldn't even have to get them to sign up. You could do that in class and then you could be the one entering the prompts in to see what kind of um, answers the, the, the chat was generating, the chat bot was generating. You can use it as a debate partner, um, just for practice or, 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 or um, to, to just get better at thinking about an, an issue. Um, you can tell it, you can tell it to role play. Say you're my deba debate partner and we're debating this and and it will it will give you, um, it will go back and forth with you. Dual assignments. So this is a, a fairly common idea and it's kind of like what I did in my course that I'm teaching right now. Um, you don't have to say that everybody has to use it. In fact, it's probably better not to figure out a way to say you can use it or not use it. And if you use it, here are the guardrails. And if you don't use it, here are the guardrails. Ways for students to use AI. So it can write things for them, um, get, help them get better at writing prompts. It can help with all sorts of tasks, outlining, suggestions, brainstorming. It can solve writer's block, which lots of experience. Um, you can feed your information and ask for, so you can put in your text and ask for feedback on it uh, for form or content or make it audience specific. Is this a good level for, for, for kids or for Seja? Um, you can get it to summarize the text and then ask follow-up questions. Teachers can use it to generate quizzes, true false questions about Romeo and Juliet. Give me 20. Um, uh, use it to simplify concepts. You can ask, you know, explain 
the big bang theory for a five-year-old, you know, uh, there's all sorts of different ways to, to do that. Um, you can get it to explain errors. I thought this was interesting. Again, it's from that site, Ditch That Textbook, um, and the idea that it's time to rethink um, cheating. And so it, the arrow goes from student created to bot created. And, you know, the student wrote everything. Uh, they consulted, the, they wrote the main ideas, but AI generated a draft and, and gave feedback. Um, the student created some AI responses and then used the best parts and submitted. Uh, they they read, edited, adjusted, submitted, or they just you know gave it all. So I think probably the top one. Most of us agree that with that would be cheating. But um, I like the questions on the left hand side. Which of these is relevant to our students' future, and which of these you know would you use in your work as an adult right now? And if we use them, that's what the quote on the, the very far left side says. If we're willing to use AI in our work right now, and lots of people have started doing that since November, um, it's only going to become more commonplace in the future. So we're kind of in it. And it's maybe not a good thing, but we're kind of in it. And we, we need to, to, to sort of rethink everything. So strategies to try to avoid AI. I actually added that try to afterwards because. I, I ran this by one of my former students who's now working in the States in computers. I think he does programming. So he's, he knows a fair amount about this. And he was like, well, I still think that I could do it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, use alternatives to writing. So mind maps, Venn diagrams, videos, podcasts, uh, presentations. But as uh, I read someplace that a mind map, you can get it to generate sort of those levels and then feed it into another program and it will sort out a, it will it will spit out a, a, a concept map for you so even even when we try to avoid it i'm not sure it's always positive possible creative demonstrations of learning so for example my drawings are a good example of that but there's also ai that can draw so um so yeah i'm not again sure that's an answer um use this one i think will work use topics outside of artificial intelligence so current for example, ChatGPT was only trained up till 2021. So anything that's happened in the world since 2021, it doesn't know anything about. So if you ask questions about events from recent times, from 21 up, it doesn't know, and then your students will have to do it until the next chat bot comes out. Um, the other thing it probably doesn't know much about are local about events or personal events. So when the, the third one is writing based on human experience. and and But again, as my student said, my former student said, yeah, but it could, you could ask it to generate a story like that. And how would you know it wasn't the student's experience? And the answer is you wouldn't. So again, this is, it, it's, it's, it's really tricky. In class writing, lots of people are saying that's what they're gonna do. And I think that's a good solution for right now, especially for this term. But I, I don't think it's a long-term solution. And that's not just me saying that, that's what everybody who's talking about this is saying. Um, one of the things that seems to come up, and I'm, I'm not completely sure either, because I think you can feed it in and ask for information about analysis of what you've written, but reflection on the product that the students made. So the essay that they wrote, reflecting on that, that sort of metacognition that shows evidence of learning. And But it could be AI assisted or not, you know? Uh, so again, that's those sort of multiple levels of, of assignment. So those are some ideas. And I like the quote at the, the left-hand side, tweak assignments so they require more synthesis, personal exploration and examination or discussion of the learning, writing, research process. Um, it can't do this kind of work for your students, making it virtually impossible for them to rely upon it for answers. So this is the last section, the wrap up. So I asked ChatGPT, overall, how can teachers balance the advantages and disadvantages of AI used by students? And it gave me, you know, kind of a nice sum up. I mean, encourage ethical use, critical thinking, integrate it into your coursework, foster a diverse range of skills that are not AI related. So I said, can you put this in a table for me? Because, you know, it's easier to see. So it did. And you'll notice that there's only one advantage compared to three disadvantages. <laughs> so it's good to support learning and research, but it has limitations and biases. It doesn't develop traditional skills and there are ethical concerns with its use. 
right? That's kind of a really good quick overview of what we just looked at. So how do you balance that? Educate students on critically evaluating results, encourage traditional forms of learning, establish clear guidelines for ethical AI use. So this is my kind of last content slide. AI is a disruptor we need to learn to live with. Um, Tad GPT and other tools like it will have negative impacts in terms of traditional at-home essays for sure, and lots of information retrieval tasks, and in the ethical implications of its use. But our students are gonna to need to deal with a world where AI is the norm and we can help them, and at the same time, try to harness AI's potential for teaching and learning. So another poll. How about now, on a scale of yes, maybe no, what are the chances that you might consider using ChatGPT in your courses? Okay, so we're kind of, we, I think we've increased. I think more people are willing to maybe try it. That's, that's what it looks like to me. So that's, that's kind of what I was hoping would come out of this, even though I have reservations uh, ethically about, about its use. I think, I think we kind of, that's where we're at. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. And I did, and, um, I'll just, we have a couple more slides here. So um, this webinar was brought to you by Performa in the University of Sherbrooke with a grant from the Ministre de l'Enseignement Supérieur. Special thanks to Swasson Lockel, Dominic Pierre, and Laura Lee Bouchard for steering the project. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of the focus for that research project is on the digital competency framework that Quebec put out and that's available free online and there's three documents that are really interesting it's worth a look at it looks longer than it is it's it's really worth it, uh, the time to go look at that and please join the practice uh, the community practice on LinkedIn that somebody's going to put the, the link for that in the chat this is the link for the workshop evaluation so you can either look use the link in the chat or you can um, use your phone to go do that it is like five questions it's really fast and it really does help us um, uh, know how this went and, and think about for planning for next time. The next big question is what's the next? There's one more webinar left with this uh, contract that I have. And uh, so if you join the community of practice on LinkedIn, you can help us think about what that topic should be for the third webinar. Right now we're leaning towards something still about AI because that just seems to be, as Laura Lee said, that seems to be where people's heads are at. Um, that's my um, references, but somebody is going to put in the link a, a much nicer looking uh, web version of that because that's pretty ugly. And I think that's it. And I can stop.